Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by Funkinstuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep into the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. Available in video format at Funkinstuff.net and on YouTube, Truth and Rhythm can also be enjoyed on the go in its audio podcast version from Funkinstuff.net, iTunes, and most leading providers. I'm your host, Scott Dr. GX Goldfine, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guide of Funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and grab it. What are you waiting for? When you're watching or listening, as always, I thank you very much for your continued interest and support. This episode's guest is none other, none other than Larry Dodson, who, until hanging up the microphone and retiring this past December, had since 1971 served as the lead singer of the Barquets. For almost a half century, his gritty and gutsy vocals were one of the most distinctive elements of this fiercely funky band, which enjoyed uncommon longevity with a string of 16 U.S. Top 20 R&B singles with Mercury Records between 1976 and 1989. The Memphis, Tennessee-based group also had two prior U.S. Top 10 R&B hits with Stax Records dating back to 1967. Dotson was among those brought in to help the Barquets carry onward after all but two members of the group perished in the December 1967 plane crash that also claimed the life of soul singer Otis Redding. The Barquets' mid-1970s to late-1980s run included seven U.S. Top 10 R&B albums, plus another five that made the Top 40. Among the dance floor gems contained on those records were Shake Your Rump to the Funk, which was a song in 1976 that introduced me to a lifetime of Barquet's grooving. Too Hot to Stop, Let's Have Some Fun, Holy Ghost, which was maybe their hardest sounding track ever, All Dance, Move Your Boogie Body, Hit and Run, Traffic Jammer, Freak Show on the Dance Floor, Sexomatic, Your Place or Mine, and Certified True. Although it was mostly the up-tempo material that charted, they also delivered many memorable mid-tempo numbers and ballads, including Attitudes, Anticipation, Running In and Out of My Life, and one of my all-time favorites, You Can't Run Away. Even years later, the Barquets unleashed one of the strongest funk albums of the 1990s called 48 Hours, which contained the tremendous closing track, Master. As recent as 2012, the Barquets notched yet another hit with Grown Folks. Along the journey, the band gained new fans and renewed momentum by having songs prominently, prominently placed in hit movies, such as Spies Like Us in the 1980s with Soul Figure and Superbad in 2007 with Too Hot to Stop. That speaks a lot to the ability of the Barquet's knack for keeping up and changing with the times. Heavily influenced through the years by contemporaries like the Ohio Players, Earth, Wind & Fire, Rick James and Prince, they were not always the most original or groundbreaking band, but they were the model of consistency with just enough of their own flavor to make it unmistakably the Barquets. And exceedingly important, they never ceased bringing the real down and dirty authentic funk. Dotson has spent the better part of the past year on a retirement tour with the band as they searched for and named his successor. Throughout his entire amazing career, there have been two critical constants, Dotson's wife of all 47 of those years and bandmate, bass player, and brother in funk, James Alexander. Thanks to Dotson's son, Larry Jr., I was able to catch up with a legendary singer at his Memphis home, and on his birthday, no less, which actually was just one day after my own. I found that he still has plenty to keep him busy, he shares stories of his colorful career, including how he was mentored by producer Alan Jones, how George Clinton helped the group get ahead, and what went into many of those unforgettable hit songs. So here in a two-part series is my special conversation with the one, the only, Larry Dotson. I'm delighted to welcome to Truth and Rhythm, Mr. Larry Dotson, who up until last month spent 47 years as lead singer for one of the most popular and successful funk soul bands of the 1970s and 1980s, the fabulous Bar Kays. He also recently released his autobiography called And the Band Plays On. Thank you so much, Larry, for joining me. How are you today? 
I'm well, thank you for uh, for an aging musician. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look great, and I understand today is your birthday, so happy birthday! Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm glad we don't get but one a year, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know how you feel. I'm in that space now too, so right with you. Right, we 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 have something in common. I understand. <laughs> well, yeah, we're both Aquariuses, so yeah. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yeah, I'm I'm good. I'm I'm actually well. Yeah. Excellent. Nineteen Excellent. days. Nineteen days into retirement, and uh, I can say all is well. Very good. Well, that's how you want retirement. You want to be able to enjoy it. Yeah, but you know what? I I can't really. Um, I don't really feel retired. I'm, I'm I'm actually busy as ever. You know, I'm, matter of fact, I'm sitting right in front of my computer now doing contracts because I still co-manage the band and uh, I have tours on the road and uh, I have a booking agency, which me and my son run. So I'm still quite busy. You know, I'm in the middle of another book. So I'm still quite busy, man. Wow. Well, good to hear. You know, that keeps you that keeps you going, you know? Absolutely right. I did not retire because I was tired of music or nor was I tired of the band or anything. You know, 47 years is a long time, you know. And, you know, my wife and I both decided at a certain time we just were going to just pump the brakes, so to speak, and and spend some time together in our latter years. She, she and I have been married 47 years, wow. which is exactly the same amount of time I've been in the band. You know, that's a long time. Yeah, That's a long time, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, all the success, continued success, you know, in this new chapter of your life. And, you know, thank you on behalf of all the fans of all, I mean, half a century, just about of amazing music. So thank you. Thank you. Well, you're quite welcome. Uh, bittersweet, bittersweet. The fans got a little bit of getting used to it. So, but, you know, I got a, I, 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 I got a good kid who's, who's taking my place and uh, he's a talented kid and uh, eventually, the fans, uh, hopefully and prayerfully, will uh, will endorse him and uh, and give him a, give him a chance to uh, show them what he has to offer in, with the Barcays. He's a really talented kid. We debuted him here in Memphis on December sixteenth, and Memphis loved him. So I hope that's a prelude for things to come. You know, how how many roughly uh, you know applicants did you end up with? Uh, good ones, <laughs> good ones. Well, you know what? I, I, I'm not, I shouldn't laugh at that. There were quite a few good ones, but we narrowed it down to really two. There was another guy who was incredible from Las Vegas, who we almost, uh, gave him the keys to the car. You don't want to know the truth, but, um, the search brought us back to Memphis, Tennessee to, uh, a kid here. Uh, we, his stage name is Chris J. And that's what we like to use. Uh, his name is Christopher Johnson. But we made the, we, we at the eleventh hour we decided to just go back to him and just just look look at him uh, thoroughly again. But it was very very difficult, a uh, very difficult choice because they were both so good, man. But we decided just um, I, we went with our gut. We went with our gut, James and I, and uh, we chose Chris, and we and we made the right choice. Well, I look forward to uh, hearing him. Yeah. Yeah, he, he'll be out there. Uh, the Barcades will start back up uh, probably in another 30 days, you know, back out on the road. Uh, as I say, I booked the band. I do 90% of the booking, so they'll be back. They'll be cranking back up in another 30 days. Okay. Want to touch briefly on, you know, your, your beginnings and then really focus a lot on those uh, Mercury years um, with the music. Mm -hmm. So, um, you got with the band in like 71 or something like that. Uh, how, how did you get, get with them and what transpired on your way to, you know, Mercury Records in a nutshell? I joined the band in 1970. I had only been with one other group and that was called the Tim Prees. It was a doo-wop group. I started that group in high school. We had we didn't really do anything uh, commercially. Uh, the band had their eyes on me because of, I guess, because of what they saw in me being in the doo-wop group. It was really their manager who had his eyes on me. Uh, he wasn't their manager at that time. He was really sort of their mentor at that time. His name was Alan Jones. He went on to be their manager, our manager, so to speak, um, and producer. Uh, 
I joined the band in 1970. Um, we went to Mercury in 19, after Stacks closed. We went there in 1976. We stayed there for 11 albums. The first album we did there was Too Hot to Stop. We did, we made five gold albums there, one platinum album and man, more. We had about 20 top 10 singles during our stay there and about 11, 12, 13, 15 top 10 albums. We had a very, very, very good stay at, at uh, Mercury Records, which went on to be Polygram. Uh, name changed a couple of times, but it was a very, very good marriage there. Well, that, that first record, I mean, you started off incredibly too hot to stop. To me, it's one of the best funk albums of the period. And um, I mean, front to back, it's just so solid. You have the huge hit, Shake Your Rump, and uh, the title track's amazing. Do you remember anything about putting that first record together? And did you feel like you really had to come out firing on that first one? Well, yeah, you know, I tell you what, when Stax closed in 1975, and we were the last group to leave Stax Records. Uh, I mean, when I literally, we were the very last group to leave. Our manager gave, he posed a, he posed a, a, a he gave us a, a choice. He said, closing, you guys got a choice. You could break up or you can go and stay and stick together and write you some incredible songs. And that's what we chose the latter. We stayed together. We 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 went to this club called the Family Fair. We played there for a year. But in the daytime, we would write songs. We wrote Shake Your Rump to the Funk. We wrote all the songs that were on the Two Out Stop album. We wrote those songs while playing in that club. Uh, and uh, we did the biggest, one of the biggest deals we had ever done. Uh, we get, we did that deal uh, for 500, for half a million dollars, man. Uh, that deal for, with, that we did with Mercury Records. And uh it relaunched our career and George Clinton allowed us to tour with him the next year and Shake Your Rump was doing very, very well. We co-starred with his tour. We did 90 days with him and all of them sold out and except for maybe six or seven. And uh, after that, it was we, it, it was all over. We, we, we were on top of the world then, man. Cameo open. We co-starred in George Clinton, and it was the mothership connection to it when he had the when he had the mothership landed the mothership. On, I mean, it was every night sold out, and Shake Your Rump was hot on the charts. Man, we we owe we owe a lot to George Clinton for allowing us to be on that tour. Yeah, what a I mean, historic tour, unbelievable. Yeah, so uh, it was uh, it was that George Clinton tour that really helped us to perpetuate our career. Uh, after that, we were just rolling, man. We were just rolling. We had some great songs on that album, though. As you said, Two Out to Stop was an incredible album. Uh, after that, it was just every other album was basically basically a gold album. Yeah, you guys, I mean, you kept the, the pedal to the metal. You, you know, kept putting out record after record after record. Every one of them had at least one hit single, it seemed like. Um, did you guys? You absolutely right. Did you guys feel pressure to deliver like that, or were you just having fun, or what? Both, <laughs> both. We the the company was on us. Uh, we were always late turning in albums. We were always getting fined, <laughs> and almost and right here for getting kicked off the label for being so late. But we were touring. We were on the road making a lot of money, man. And it was it was difficult meeting uh, meeting our contractual uh, obligations to turn. I think we had to turn an album in every nine months, and it was very difficult to do that and stay on the road. We were working four five nights a week, hmm. you know, making thirty five forty thousand dollars a night. So, which is great money at that time, wow. you know. So, uh, you know, and and you know, being as young guys who were just who had never had any 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 kind of success like that we were it was something man we were it, it was it those were times I, I would never would never trade anything for could you lean back a little bit again Larry? yeah uh -huh. there you go. Uh, but we had a good we had a good producer we were learning to be good good songwriters we loved what we were doing we wrote from the experiences that we were having 
And uh, we were doing a pretty good job at it, man. I'll say. So can you tell me a little bit what the band was like in the studio? How did the creative process work? How collaborative was it? Who were the key players? And what role did Alan Jones play? Alan was the overseer. He was the smart guy. Uh, he was he was the in no 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 in no uh, no doubt about it, he was the producer. Myself, uh, Harvey Henderson, the sax player, Winston Stewart, the keyboard player. We were the nucleus. We were the songwriters. Uh, not to take anything else away from everybody else. Everybody else contributed. We recorded live. Uh, most of every, most most of the time, you know, that which put everybody in the band in the studio. But we came up with most of the music. We wrote most of the songs, you know. Um, I was the singer. I, there were only maybe in the whole history of the group, there may have been two songs that I didn't lead. Mm -hmm. And I wrote those songs intentionally for the other two guys. So um, did you guys do many uh, uh, TV appearances? And, and what what were some of the most unforgettable uh, stage and TV experiences that you had back then? Well, to this day, Watch Stax was by far the most incredible and the most memorable performance we've ever had. When we went on stage, it was 100,000 people. And that happened while we were at Stax. Uh, we had no idea it was going to be such a phenomenal performance. Uh, we stole the show, so to speak. Why Stax turned out to be an incredible movie. Uh, we did Soul Train many, many times. Um, Don Kirshner's rock concert was uh, was one of the highlights of our career because it was very difficult for an African-American act to get on Don Kirshner's rock concert. Um, those are just some of the things that we did. There were others that were sort of difficult to do, but I can't think of them just off the top of my head. But when you got on Soul Train, you kind of had you, you kind of had arrived. But Don Kirshner's rock concert, yeah. Why no? Uh, why never a live album from the Bar Case? You know that's a good question. We. Uh, I don't know, you know, our, our record label, they never encouraged us to do that. And I don't know why, you know, I, I don't know if it was the fact they didn't have much confidence in selling live albums. I don't know why they never encouraged that. It was not something that we didn't want to do, but they never encouraged us to do live albums, you know, a live album. Um, Cause we, we, we played at some of the most prestigious places, Whiskey Go Go, the Tribute, uh, the uh, Tribador, Troubadour, um, uh, uh, just a lot of, a lot of just prestigious places that were good places to do live albums, but they just, they never asked us to do it, never encouraged us to do it. And uh, I guess we never pushed the issue. Now, later in our career, we, we did on our own, we did record live and we have live recordings in our in our um on our label now which we will which we have released as a matter of fact on our own <laughs> done in different places you know so do you, do you think there's any uh a film or audio of you guys playing live from back in the day somewhere oh yeah i will playing stuff on youtube i mean it's just a, a plethora of stuff <laughs> all over the place probably too much you know we have stuff that we did uh on our three trips to uh, playing for the troops in Iraq, we have uh, 28 tapes that we recorded over there, unre unreleased, that we will you know, go through and make live recordings from those. Uh, we kept those. We did in 2009, 2010, and 2011. Well, now you're retired, you can be more of an archivist also. <laughs> oh yeah, I plan to do all of that. Our, our 50th anniversary, uh, we had that was recorded and filmed. Uh, our 30th anniversary was recorded and filmed. So yeah, I, I'm going to go through all those things now that I actually have the time to do that. And and those things are really good, man. Excellent. Look forward to that. I want to just throw out a couple of uh, albums along the way that to me, I think were highlights among the highlights, if you will. 
Um, okay. Uh, Enjoy. That was a great one with Move Your Boogie Body and uh, Up in Here. And I mean, that was just a really strong one, I thought. Um, do you remember anything about like that period? That's like we're talking like 79, 80, anything stand out? Movie Boogie Body was the biggest single up until we released Freak Show. It was the biggest single we had ever had. It was almost a gold single. It was almost a gold single. And you know, here's a bit of trivia probably that you probably won't believe. Out of all the accomplishments that we've had, we've never had a number one record. And I tell you why, we, our release period was always in the winter. It was also Michael Jackson's release period. Uh. <laughs> so, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> we could never outlast waiting for Michael Jackson to come off of number one. <laughs> we would always be number two, number three, but we could never last till Michael Jackson came off of number one. Thus, we could never, ever have, we never, ever had a number one record. Well, that's just not fair. <laughs> Well, I know, I know. But had we chosen a different release period, we would have had several number one records. That's 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 something that people don't really, really know about the group, you know. It's nothing I boast about, but, you know, it's just, it's unfortunate, man. It's just really, not really cool. But um, we chose always to release our albums right when Michael Jackson was releasing his. So it was, it was tough. Did, did you guys have sort of a formula in mind that you would do a certain amount of up-tempo, a certain amount of ballads, and a certain amount of mid-tempo on the records? Uh, not really, you know. Well, I tell you what, we, we, were, we were deemed the party band, so and our record label always wanted more up-tempo records from us than ballads. And, you know, I tell you what, it was funny. And it wasn't something that we really endorsed or liked. They didn't like for us to release the ballads. They always wanted us to keep the slow songs inside of the album. And people loved our ballads, but they always wanted, I guess it was good marketing for them. They wanted people to, they wanted us to keep the ballads inside the album so that people have to buy the album to get those records, which was good marketing strategy for them. Like anticipation was never seen. That's what came in my mind first. Right, absolutely right. It was never a single. Biggest, one of the biggest records and most popular records we've ever had. It was never a single. Attitudes was never a single. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are songs that we cannot leave the stage without doing. I can't, I, I don't think Unforgettable Dreams was a single. All of these were just, just big, big singles, big, uh, uh, big records for us. But they were never well, the, the record label would never never let us make them make them singles. They were the ones too that were also real popular at the house parties I went to back then. Oh, absolutely yeah. right. Slow dance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, night cruising was another one that was uh, sort of a landmark, I think, in your in your history there, because hit and run uh was, you know, a big hit. And you had several hits on there. And Traffic Jammer is one of my favorites, especially that 12 inch version. Now that album, we that was our one of our concept albums. If you notice, all those songs, most of them were all about nightlife, hit and run, traffic jammer. Uh, they were all having to do with driving and nightlife and the the whole nightlife scene, and it, it, it all they all accentuated the night night cruising. Uh, let me think of some more. Can you name some more? Because I've I, I, freaky I behavior. Some. Yeah. Okay. Was that on that album? Yeah. Uh, okay. Unforgettable dream. Backseat driver. Backseat driver. Okay. See, all of those played on night cruising. Yeah. Feels like make it. Uh, feels like I'm falling in love. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Touch tone. So yeah. Touch tone. Hot number. Yeah. 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 All those kind of accentuated the uh, the nightlife, so to speak. Though that was a concept, but that was a good. We we enjoyed we enjoyed making that album. We had a lot of fun, man. a lot of fun, a lot of fun shooting the cover. I think um, another one that kind of took you to a different level. I was a DJ at the time, 
and uh, uh -huh. the record with uh, Freak Show on the Dance Floor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, when we did that record, I mean, we went to the stratosphere. <laughs> it was uh, an incredible video. Um, just an, it, it took us to another level, man. It just, big movie, just, uh, it just took us somewhere else. And everything that happened after that, added another zero onto our bank account, to our performance. It was zero, 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 zero. And I guess I guess groups have those records that really, uh, if, you, if you stay around and you're lucky enough, you'll get a record like that in your career. Sometimes if you're real lucky, you'll get two records like that. But Freak Show was that for us. Uh, it was in, it, it was in uh, a lot of different movies that came along after that, you know. All of which made us a lot of money, man. You know, it's funny is it it, it, seemed, it crossed over a lot, but it didn't really cross over that much on the charts. But I'll tell you, out there with the public, it was a crossover hit. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it really, really did, man. It it did a lot of stuff for us. But you're right, though. It didn't it didn't cross over on the charts, but it, in the minds of the people, you know, it it was. Uh, it did. It, it was a crossover record to them. When you were cutting a song like that, did you guys kind of sense it in the studio that, hey, this is going to be a hit? We And you know what? We did. And you know what? It didn't take us long to write that record. <clears throat> we, that was one of the ones that came very, very quickly. I didn't write uh, Harvey K. Harvey, a saxophone player, he came up with the title. We wrote that record fairly quick. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes that happens in the studio. Sometimes you're scratching your brains for weeks at a time before you can get the second verse done. But that one came quick, man. I remember we did that one in the studio and we had done that record very, very quickly. So did you really find really fun to do? I'm sorry? It was a really fun record to do. So Larry, did you kind of did you have much guidance in how you would lay down your vocals uh, or did you get uh, kind of just do it from your, your soul and on your own or how did you choose the vocal arrangements and, and you know, your style? Um, I tell you what, Alan Jones was the guy who guided me through everything I did in the studio. He was uh, he was an idol maker, man. He from the very first time I got into the group uh, until he passed. He, he guided me. Uh, he guided me all the way, man. You know, he he gave me freedom as I grew, you know, as I got older. But he taught me a lot, man. He, he taught me how to record. He taught me all the tricks of the trade and and my style. He helped me to create my style because when I joined the band, I, I was 19 without a style. And the Barquets didn't have a lead singer. It was an instrumental group. So what I brought to the band was I breathed life into an instrumental band who had no singer. And I wasn't sure what I was as a singer. So he showed me what I did. I was a diamond in the rough. So as time went on, I started to develop this sort of Mick Jagger, Tina Turner, wrapped up into one kind of a runchy, uh, runchy's rough around the edges kind of vocal. And we, and we found something inside of me, you know, and we developed that. And it became the signature voice of the Barquets. And from that, we just how to expand on that, soften that at times, you know, how to make it romantic at times. And then, uh, you know, I, I learned a bit of my own and uh, I emulated a lot of from Sly Stone and Ray Charles, which were my, which were my idols, you know. So with those are just things that were inside of me. And Alan knew he was a very smart guy. He knew what was in my soul, you know. So he let me be comfortable, you know, and he let me be me. 
And he he wasn't such a dictator, you know. I've seen some producers that just bam guys hit up and said, "No, I don't want you to do this. I want you to be this. I want you to sing it this way, this way, this way." And you get a, an artificial vocal, you know. Mm-hmm. He wasn't like that. He was stern, but he let me be me. And there you have it. A huge thanks to my special guest, the Barclays Larry Dotson, one of the most important and accomplished funk singers of all time. Also, sincere thank you to viewers and listeners. Thank you so much for the continued interest and faith. Be sure to look out for upcoming Truth and Rhythm episodes and catch up with previous, install, previous installments at funkandstuff.net on YouTube, iTunes, and other leading providers. And we want to hear from you. Drop me an email at scottg at funkandstuff.net. Let me know what you like, what you don't like, and who else you want to see on the show. It's your show. This is for you, the music fan. So until next time, as always, this is Scott, Dr. GX Goldfine, saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.